from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Welcome. My name is Isabella Marquez de Castilla. I am the Deputy Director of the National Library Service for the Blind and Physically Handicapped Library of Congress. And today, it is my pleasure and honor to introduce to you Andres Newman. Andres is a prize-winning Argentine-Spanish author. He also writes poetry. His works include Traveler of the Century and Talking to Ourselves. Today, Andres will be talking about his new book of short stories, The Things We Don't Do. Please join me in welcoming a very talented and successful writer, Andres Newman. Good afternoon. Thanks for coming. You're more than I expected. Why? <laughs> that means I'm slightly more scared than expected. <laughs> Can a bottle keep standing like that? Yes, so it's like a miracle. OK, so it's a pleasure for me to be here. Thanks so much for coming and, and overcoming the heat and, and the difficult atmospheric conditions. This is a sunny, hot place. Not precisely this room. Maybe that's why you came. <laughs> uh, well, this afternoon I'm presenting uh, two different books. Uh, the one that mentioned Isabella, thank you very much for presenting me. The novel, uh, well, the book of stories, The Things We Don't Do. And the second one is a novel titled Talking to Ourselves. So uh, during my talk uh, here and there, I will be uh, intercalating uh, very brief readings during my talk so that you can get a, at least a flavor of them. Can you hear me? Yeah. Thanks, God. Uh, no, because when I'm nervous, you know, I, I, I speak in a very loud voice, and that seems to be interesting in the beginning. But after half an hour, people uh, begin to be upset because they can't hear. Um, so I think three or four hours uh, will be enough, right? <laughs> No, it's not true. It will be uh, half an hour uh, maximum, and then I will be more than delighted to, to get questions from the lovely audience. Um, as for the novel, Talking to Ourselves, uh, in first place, um, and only apparently, it is a road story and a tribute to parenthood. Um, it takes place in an imaginary geography I was born in Buenos Aires, Argentina, and I live in Spain. I did school in both shores, and that's why I spent all my life trying to uh, fill the gap between those two shores. Uh, someone said very famously that uh, the UK and the States uh, were uh, separated by the same language, and pretty much the same happens with Latin America and Spain sometimes. Uh, and since I spent uh, half of my childhood in one shore and the, the other half in the other shore, I've always tried to, to imagine um, impossible bridges uh, that make them closer. And precisely this road story uh, between the father, Mario, and the son, Lito, without them noticing uh, this track, uh, his driving, goes through these impossible imaginary bridges that unite uh, Latin America and Spain. So sometimes you can get the feeling that the book uh, takes place in, a, say, uh, Patagonia uh, or Mexico, and suddenly it looks like Andalusia, South Spain. So these secondary roads are the roads that should exist in my life in order to go and come back quickly from Latin America to Spain. Uh, and as for parenthood, I've always been fascinated by um, the slight, we, we could call it the slight science fiction of parenthood. Uh, yes, you know that. <laughs> because having children is it's supposed to be about, you know, working for the future of your children, making, them, uh, the, making their future life easier. But at the same time, the secret task of parenthood 
uh, at least as I see it, is working on their memory, their future memory. I will be there in your memory, even if I'm not here anymore. And this is the science fiction part, right? Because you're working in the past and in the future at the very same time. Is to insert yourself in someone else's memory while you're working for their future. And I'm very interested in it, and that's the conflict that Mario has more intensely because he has not much time left for, for reasons that you will find out if you're brave enough to get the book. Um, <laughs> so, so I'm gonna read very, very uh, short uh, passages from the road story and the parenthood part. I prefer that, ver that version. I always, I always think that's so beautiful if you could just be so precise as their gestures. <laughs> they write very well with their hands. Um, this is the 10 years old Lito. We arrive at Veracruz de los Aros, and then it happens again. The sky clouds over, all at once. First, I thought it was a fluke. No, no way. I've done loads of tests, and it works. If I concentrate really hard, the weather changes. I don't know how has, who has the power, Pedro, the truck, or me, but it's true. Maybe that's why they gave the truck that name. Wasn't he the saint who carried around the keys of heaven? I was worried that dad might laugh at me and all that. I know him so well. I'm glad he takes me much more seriously now. That's the good thing about being 10 and sharing a truck. So I told him about my discovery. Dad tested it too, and he saw it was true. It depends on my mood. If everything's okay, it's sunny. If I get bored, it, cl it clouds over a bit. When I'm restless, it gets windy. If I get angry and cry, it rains. The other day, for instance, Dad was furious because I stuck my arms out of the window. It scares me when Dad balls at me like that. And that night, where there was lightning. Of course, you have to be patient. The sky won't change as soon as I think of it. It's like Dad says, you have to drive a long way to travel a short distance. But if I keep it up, eventually it happens, like meal times. <laughs> Are you hungry? <laughs> yes, said someone. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, and then, it's funny because I have the wrong number, pages number, because I actually have the, the, the British Numbers, that, that's funny. But I'm not nervous. <laughs> uh, so the advice is part. This is Mario talking to a, to a recorder, tape recorder. Enjoy life, do you hear? It's hard work enjoying life. And have patience, not too much. And look after yourself as if you knew you won't, al you won't always be young even though you won't know it, and that's okay. And have plenty of sex, son. <laughs> Do it for your sake and mine and even your mother's, lots of sex. And if you, if, you have, if you have children, have them late, please. And go to the beach in winter. In winter it's better, you'll see. My head hurts, yet I feel good, it's hard to explain. And go traveling on your own once in a while, and try not to fall in love all the time. And care about your looks, do you hear me? Uh, men who don't care about their looks are afraid. In short, advice isn't much use. If you disagree with it, you don't listen. And if you already agree, you don't need it. <laughs> never trust advice, son. Travel agents advise you to go places they've never been. You love me more when you're old. 
I thought of my father the moment we got down from the truck. Our true love for our parents is posthumous. Forgive me for that. I am already proud of the things you're going to do. I love the way you count the time on your fingers when you set the alarm clock. Or do you think I don't see? You do it secretly under the covers so I won't know you have difficulty working it out. I'm going to ask you a favor. Wherever happens, whatever age you are, don't stop counting the time on your fingers. Promise me, octopus. So that's, ah, thank you. Thank you, octopuses. Good at, good at clapping, octopuses. Uh, in second place, the novel Talking to Herself is a tribute uh, to two uh, peripheral roles um, which would in fact deserve to become central someday, both in our lives and in literature, in fiction, in case fiction exists. The one of Penelope and the one of the caregivers. As for the first one, Penelope, uh, I, I'm fascinated by the idea of a literally, literary challenge to imagine what happened to all of the Penelopes that uh, were left out from those literary journeys uh, uh, through the history of, of literature, those male heroes going and finding themselves and finding their uh, own identity, while the female character was supposed, very supposed, to stay at home. Uh, so, so in my opinion, there would be a, an interesting way of rereading all the tradition and asking ourselves about, about all those Penelope's, supposedly waiting, but perhaps having an adventure of their own. So, so this Rose story uh, begins to look uh, like the traditional way of Rose story, but uh, gradually, it, uh, the, 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 um, the main focus moves towards the position of the Penelope, the one who stayed at home doing pretty interesting things, which I won't tell you. <laughs> um, and as for the caregivers, you know, if we think about uh, illness and traditional narrative, we find that very frequently the, the stories focused on illness are pretty much about the uh, ill people themselves, as if the ill character was able to absorb it everything uh, without leaving room for anyone else. But tragically enough, uh, the, the caregiver, caregivers themselves deny themselves the right to, to, to have a story. Um, so uh, I think, well, unfortunately, sooner or later, almost everybody has their own story of loss. I, I suppose, and yet at the same time, we all end up uh, learning something crucial through that process. Uh, in my personal case, uh, I, will, I will tell you my personal story, why I ended up being interested in this subject. Um, when, when I was very young, I almost lost my father, who was very ill, and I remember myself waiting for him to, to live or die in the... Uh, in front of the uh, operating room, you say, or printing. That's it, thank you. I won't try to attempt to pronounce that, but we understand each other. Um, so, so I was um, like uh, waiting for the result of this operation and, and, and being very aware that my life was changing in that very moment. And then I was given the shoes of my father in a junk bag a plastic black bag, as if it, my father had, had turned into uh, some junk uh, and some, some trash. And in that moment, I knew that my life had changed forever. But uh, interestingly enough, and, and fortunately enough, he saved, he saved his life. My mother and me uh, were taking care of him until here. It's like the normal uh, story. But, but well, he recovered and he's doing very, very good nowadays, I must tell you. But a few years after that, it was my mom who got ill and, and died. And my father and me were taking care of her. So the interesting and painful learning I got from, from this is that maybe the, the, the strong character, in that case, mom, my mom, can be the weak one. 
how can, how can we know who is the strong character? And how can we ask the others to be the strong part of the story all the time? So I became interested in the weaknesses of the strong characters. That, that's, that's why I wanted to tell the story of the one who's not supposed to have a story, the caregiver instead of the ill one. Um, I'm going to, to read you, by the way, from, from... No, I won't, because it will be late. Uh, but there is a story here in, in this book, The Things We Don't Do, about this experience of having uh, the shoes of my father in a plastic bag. Uh, what about the usual conflicts of the caregiver? In my opinion, those are uh, you know, guilt, guilt of being alive, being healthy, anticipation. Should I imagine a future without this person that will sort of prepare me? But at the same time, if I do that too much, I will lose the the little time I do still have with this person, so should I prepare or not more guilt? Um, some not uh, confessable resentment for being abandoned by the ill one, but you will never confess that. Uh, and as I said before, not having, this is the worst thing I, in long term, not giving yourself the right to tell your story. Uh, and not giving yourself the right to pleasure. I don't have the right to pleasure if there's someone that I love suffering so much. This is the center of the conflict. So Elena as a fiction, is a, a fictional experiment with all those feelings, and she becomes like a monster of these conflicts in the novel, talking to herself. Uh, in other words, as she puts it, uh, a patient's rights go unquestioned. No one talks about the rights of the caregiver. During the novel, some dark humor reflections uh, up here. For example, this one. You know when you're having a hard time and everybody else seem, seems happy? And you hate it, really? <laughs> and you hate to hate it? And you hate to hate to hate to hate it? And etc. Yeah. So, I think this bit pretty much summarize it. If I... <laughs> if I find it. Oh, British people. Here. I love them. Elena is very dark humored, which is, I think, is the only way to uh, confront pain. I mean, humor is not for easy times. It's precisely, was precisely invented to face tragedy. So tragic comedy, in my opinion, is uh, the, the genre of reality. So she says this. She is supposed to be to, to having a grief process and everything, and she sees a perfectly happy couple in front of her. When I see a couple kissing, believing they love one another, believing they will endure, whispering into each other's ear in the name of an instinct to which they give lofty names, when I see them caressing one another with that embarrassing avidness, the, that expectation of discovering something crucial in the other's skin, when I see their mouths becoming entangled, the exchange of tongues, their freshly showered hair, their unruly hands, fabric rubbing and lifting up like the most sordid of curtains, the anxious stick of knees bouncing like springs, cheap beds in one-night hotels they will later remember as palaces. When I see two fools, expressing their desire with impunity in broad daylight, as, as though I weren't watching them. It's not merely envy I feel. I also pity them. I pity their rotten future. And I get up and ask for the bill and I smile at them as cans, as though I had returned from a war which the two of them have no idea is about to commence. <laughs> this is the peaceful Elena. Uh, yeah. What else? What else? Mm, Elena finds too many resources to face reality and defend herself from loss. Books and sex, it is literary pleasure and physical pleasure. We can't blame her, right? So, uh, in first place, Elena and her relationship with reading. She keeps a diary um, about her readings. 
uh, on the novel you won't find mere quotations, but rather sort of dialogue between what she reads and what she thinks. Um, uh, I wanted to tell the story of what happens inside a reader's mind while they are reading. And you can see that in the syntax too, because you won't find a quotation in an academic uh, traditional way, but you will see uh, uh, a mixture of her words and the words that she is reading as a, as a true exchange of words and ideas. And uh, about the fun function of books, particularly in hard times, uh, do you think, I don't know, that books are simple, for example, painkillers? Do they work just like any other form of entertainment? Uh, just to forget our problems for a while, which is good, but is it enough? Uh, or perhaps books are rather a form of actually um, naming, understanding, and eventually uh, getting over those uh, problems, though that pain, by doing something creative and meaningful with that pain. Um, she says, Elena says, for example, I'll spend the afternoon reading my nerves are calmed by reading. No, not true. They aren't calm. They change direction. I suspect this book will be not so much a painkiller as a vaccine. It will inoculate me with the unease I'm striving to overcome. If you don't name your pain, that pain will last forever, hidden. To sum it up, reading, I wonder, reading in order to forget our problems uh, or in order to study them, so to speak, to actually make ourselves uh, stronger in front of them. And something else that Elena does with her books. Do you underline your books? Yeah. No? Yeah. Who, who's not in favor of underlining books? Hmm. Why? Because they get what uh, spoiled or yeah folded, and they can have some back, some pain in the back. The poor, <laughs> the poor guys, you know. Like I understand that, I, but at the same time, when you underline a book, that copy is definitely your copy, not in a possessive way. But I do possess my books, <laughs> but in a way that someone read that book in a very unique way. I mean, no one else would underline the same ideas. You know when you get the, these secondhand books and you see someone else's underlines and that annoys you but fascinates you? <laughs> because you're like spying someone else's life. You say, oh, I think I know what happened with this person. <laughs> I would never underline that. <laughs> so uh, Elena com compulsively underlines her books um, because I think that some, sometimes reading and underlining, it's like the symbol of this, it's like having an idea in someone else's head. You know, there's a story between uh, two Spanish writers, a very funny story. Uh, they were talking about their respective uh, future new books, and they were playing uh, poker, you say? Yeah, is that the pronunciation? So they're playing cards, uh, and... Um, and one says, you know, I'm working on a novel which will, will be titled uh, El Desorden de tu Nombre. Mijas y Gandara. Yes, madam. <laughs> you will get a free copy <laughs> from someone else's book. <laughs> Some better writer. Uh, but yeah, so, so they were playing cards. This is the story they tell. And, and, and one of them says, you know what, I'm working on a novel title, El Desorden de tu Nombre, your name's disorder, the disorder of your name. And, and the other one like, gets pale, and he says, well, that's the title I was searching for. <laughs> he says, I'm sorry, but it's my title. And the second one says, no, it's not. It's my title, my title and I had that, this idea in your head. 
and, and you know, and they had this argue about this, this argument about this, and they eventually decided to, to you know, to bet, to have a bet, and the one who wins in the, with the cards will keep the title. As you can imagine, the second one won and stole the title, and not only this, but one of his most successful novels ever was that one with the, someone else's title. Yes, life is hard and writing is even harder. <laughs> so, and, and I think that when we underline our books, it's, it's a bit this what happens. You know, Elena says, when a book tells me something I was trying to say, I feel the right to appropriate its words as if they had once belonged to me and I were taking them back. And somewhere else on her diary, she writes about those uh, living creatures we call books. I wonder whether, perhaps without realizing it, we seek out the books we need to read, or whether books themselves, which are intelligent entities, detect their readers and catch their eye. In the end, every book is the I Ching. You pick it up, open it, and there it is, there you are. And the underlines work a bit like, that, like this, I think. Um, well, and secondly, um, Elena and her relationship uh, with her own body, right, and the physical beauty in general. In the end of the day, uh, this is something somehow uh, related to her interest in reading, because I think that literature, one of the highest tasks of literature, is to criticize and reformulate uh, the forms of beauty, instead of reproducing uh, traditional models, uh, rather inventing uh, new ones. And I think that this is a task that liter literature can actually do much better than, for instance, cinema or photography that nowadays, in general, of course, in general seem to be uh, a bit stuck uh, in some very uh, restrictive and quite oppressive models of physical beauty. Uh, in this sense, to me, poetry is the opposite uh, of Photoshop. Um, and, um, and well, Elena, for, for instance, says, this is essential when in bed with a man, not what I see in his body, what he can make me see in mine. Yeah, and well, Elena ends up having a difficult love story. Now, there was an interesting bit, but I will skip it. Uh, she ends up having a difficult uh, love story, uh, sort of triangle, and as usual, uh, choosing the wrong, the, the wrong person, uh, or the less recomm recommendable person. I wouldn't tell you with whom, but I'll read you instead this uh, flash fiction on a love triangle from the book of stories. Almost finishing. For example. My name is Marcos. I have always wanted to be Cristobal. <laughs> I don't mean I want to be called Cristobal. He's my friend. I was going to say my best friend, but I have to confess he is the only one. Gabriela is my wife. She loves me a lot and sleeps with Cristobal. Yeah. He is intelligent, self-assured, an agile dancer. He also writes, is proficient at Latin grammar, cooks for women, then eats them for lunch. <laughs> I would say that my Gabriela is his favorite dish. Some uninformed person might think my wife is betraying me. Nothing could be further from the truth. I have always wanted to be Cristobal, but I do not simply stand there watching. I practice not being Marcos. I take dancing lessons and pour over my student textbooks. I am well aware my wife adores me. So much so that the poor thing sleeps with him, with the man I wish to be. <laughs> Nestling against Cristobal's muscular chest, my Gabriela is anxiously awaiting me, arms open wide. Such patience on her behalf thrills me. 
I only hope my efforts meet her expectations and that one day soon our moment will come. That moment of unswerving love that she has been preparing so diligently, cheating on Cristobal, getting accustomed to his body, his character, and his taste is, so that she will be as comfortable and happy as can be when I am like him and will leave him all alone. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, congratulations, Gabriela. So, yeah, love and couples. Doubtless, one of our favorite subjects, uh, should I say problems, uh, to write and read about. But going on with the critic on traditional models, not everything needs to be about what we restlessly do and do and do. This would be like the traditional epic logic. And I think we should think for a while about the, the danger to, to the danger of applying the product productivity logic to our emotions. Let's do this, let's do that. I think that literature, for example, poetry, that whole literature could be as well the secret, secret epic of not doing things, not doing anything in particular, that, uh, not doing anything in particular together. I think that would be a good definition of love. And that's why I'd like to finish with two little things. One, uh, this brief uh, reflection, Elena, the character of Talking to Herself, writes on company since this afternoon here uh, we've been certainly in good company. She says, companionship isn't about experiencing great moments together. True companionship is the other stuff, sharing a sincere doing nothing. And nothing that can be or mean everything sometimes. So last but not least, I would like to share with you the shortest story I have ever written and the shortest story of this little book, which is called, of course, The Things We Don't Do. And then we, we, can, we can have a small dialogue. Bye bye. <laughs> this is interesting because I, I really broke this. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Literature can be dangerous. The things we don't do. I like that we don't do the things we don't do. I like our plans on waking when morning slings onto our bed like a cat of light. Plans we never realize because we get up late after imagining them for so long. I like the anticipatory tremor in our muscles from the exercises we list without doing the gyms we never join, the healthy habits we conjure, as if simply by desiring them, our bodies will glow from their radiance. <laughs> I like the travel guides you browse with that absorption I so admire and whose monuments, streets, and museums we will never set foot in as we sit mesmerized in front of our milky coffees. I like the restaurants we don't go to the light from the candles, the imagined taste of their dishes. I like the way how our house looks when we picture it refurbished. Its startling furniture, its lack of walls, its bold colors. I like the languages we wished we spoke and dream of learning next year as we smile at each other in the shower. I hear from your lips those sweet, hypothetical languages. Their words fill me with purpose. Propose. I like all the proposals, spoken or secretive, which we both fail to carry out. That is what I like most about sharing our lives. The wonder open up elsewhere. The things we don't do. Thank you. Thank you very much. You have il we have 11 minutes left at least. 10, <laughs> to be more exact. <laughs> yeah, my, about my life as a writer in Spain. Um, 
Yeah, it's a very sunny life, I must tell you. <laughs> I, li I live in South Spain, in Granada, which is a very beautiful and small city in the south. M some of you maybe were there. Uh, it's a very uh, comfortable and beautiful city. And uh, when I'm not traveling, like now, and, and sharing, sharing things and ideas with people as nice as you, I am almost stuck in my house uh, writing and um, and since this is a very small city, I can go walking everywhere. So it's a very much province life, which I enjoy very, very much because uh, I think that gives me like a warmer context to observe the other people. I pretty much think while I'm walking, you know that the, the German philosopher Kant used to used to uh, think while walking. He couldn't sit and write the philosophy. Uh, before uh, taking a good walk, so I think that someone should invent, you know, a typewriter, typewriter machine by walk. Would be, I would be a buyer of that, <laughs> and I do that. And and as well, uh, sometimes I go to to the shore. There, there is a there, there is the Mediterranean Sea, one hour drive, and sometimes I go there. So as you can see, I suffer a lot. Yeah, I, 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 I was a teacher of Latin American literature in the University of Granada as well. Uh, I was fired. No, it's not true. <laughs> but I, I quit and I stopped uh, being a teacher. But uh, when, I, when I was doing that job, I, I had many relationships with other writers in, in the university, in the, in the literature faculty in Granada. Yes. Mm. Wow. The answer to your question, for example, I hope nobody steals <laughs> my right answer right now. Uh, no, but you know what? Uh, it's interesting because on one hand, one could argue that there are some ideas that we very much appreciate and we don't want, we don't want that someone else takes them. But at the same time, I don't think that literature is on abstract ideas, but it's more about how we develop them. And I don't think that two people could do this, the same thing with the same idea, you know what I mean? So, so it would be very interesting, and uh, sometimes in the workshops they do so, uh, to, to gather a few writers and, and give them exactly the same starting point and see what happens. So in the end, I don't think that we have such original ideas that we're trying to rewrite the same starting points, but no one goes to the same arriving point. Arrival point? The, um, arrival? Thanks for the lessons. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god, it's the most important reader of Washington. How are you? Good. Um, What's are you? your name? Ana Maria. Please meet you. <laughs> Were you were you interested in writing when you were a kid? When I was a kid, not as beautiful as you, I was very interested in writing and playing soccer, not necessarily in this order. <laughs> but as you can see, I'm not precisely the most athletic man in the world. Why do you laugh? <laughs> and uh, so I stopped uh, playing soccer, and I could only uh, uh, preserve my vocation for for writing and reading. I was pretty sure that I wanted to be a writer when I was like, I don't know, maybe a bit older than, than you, like nine or 10 or 11. But I, I always enjoyed, you know, playing with words and retelling the stories that my parents told me with my own words. It was like a family workshop without noticing. And since I didn't, ha didn't know how to, to tape, uh, to type, uh, I could spend like two or three hours each page in a very old-fashioned typewriter. And I enjoyed it that much that I was sure that reality is much more interesting while you are writing it or reading it. 
don't let the other people tell you that it's a waste of time. You're gaining time while you're <laughs> reading or writing. You're living multiple lives instead of only one. Poor people that has only one life. That's so boring. <laughs> we have a few more minutes. I'll take a Hi. Hi. What is the most uh, difficult uh, part of being a writer? And what is the most rewarding part of being one? The most rewarding part has just taken place <laughs> just a minute ago. And the most uh, difficult thing is perhaps, uh, you know, sometimes you're working on, say, a novel or a collection of stories for five or six years. Uh, for example, this, this very slim book took me like three years and a half. And you're doing so without no one knowing it or reading it, reading it. And you sometimes think, what if this is a very terrible mistake? Where will all these years go to? Um, so the most scary part of, of being a writer is when you're finishing and you, on one hand, are really dying to finish the book. And on the other hand, you don't want to finish it, just in case. Um, so yes, this uncertainty, whether you wrote a good book, is, that panic is al always painful. And it doesn't matter how many books you actually published, it's always the same. And there is another uh, hard part, and if there, there are writers here, they will, they will confirm this almost, I'm, I'm sure. Because uh, when you finish a book, you think that was your last book. Which is, in a way, stupid, because if you wrote, you know, 15 books, it's very, you're very likely to write the number 16. That's logical. But very deep inside yourself, you think that was your last book, and you won't be able to focus like that and connect yourself with the, with the story so strongly. And this period, until you uh, start a new material, to me, is the worst part. Uh, I, I, I don't know how to live without writing. So, so uh, to me, life is very enjoyable as long as I am reading it or writing it at the same time. Gracias. Hi. 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 Um, so hearing you today uh, made me feel like uh, I was justified in coming to the National Festival. Oh, come on. So Thank you so much. Let's, uh, I will throw another thing I apologize. <laughs> I apologized earlier today about not having read you on Rulfo, mm -hmm. and I want to apologize to you that I've not read you, but you seem to be a novelist of ideas, and your characters seem to uh, give flesh and blood to the ideas that you're preoccupied with. It reminds me of a very different kind of a writer uh, from Czechoslovakia, Milan Kundera, who also was very much a novelist of ideas. I wanted to know from you, who are the other writers that you admire? in contemporary times and in the, from the past that you really love. I'm definitely going to read you, so don't worry. I'm going to buy your books right away and read you. But I also well, want to know what you love. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, we can meet and talk a bit more in the signings in the, the below uh, after that, because I, it would take me like uh, an hour to answer. But you put it so beautifully, because giving flesh and body to our ideas, that's pretty much fiction for me. It's not only a character representing uh, an abstract, uh, abstract reflection, but rather to, to search the physical, emotional contradictions of these ideas, like having, having a debate uh, on your own flesh. Um, you know, there were very generally talking, there were like two different traditions, you know, the bookish tradition, say, like Borges, Marcel Schaub, uh, Giovanni Papini, um, nowadays, say, Enrique Villamatas, these um, very great writers, uh, writing about writers, writing about writers, etc., etc., like living in the library. And there was supposedly, like, the opposite tradition, like se sex, drugs, and rock and roll, you know, the beat generation, you know, this uh, began with the French 19th century, the modit poets, and everything. So this tradition of not having time to translate Japanese poetry because you are enjoying life. And this kind of dichotomy 
was sold by some authors I admire very much. And I would like to mention, for example, Roberto Bolaño, who knew that uh, books give you a more body and studying your body leads you to literature, not renouncing none of those two supposed shores. And as you can see, I'm always trying to uh, reunite shores somehow. One minute, two minutes left. Well, that's eternity for Japanese poetry. Hello, uh, I wanted to thank you for being here and also want to thank, thank you for uh, the, uh, tr um, the Traveler of the Century. Oh, uh, thank it you. It is a postmodern uh, work of art. Really enjoyed it. So my question is about that. Uh, that book is a lot about uh, transformation, sort of the European transformation and also the transformation of love of Hans. Uh, what ex inspired you to write that sort of transformation and did you travel a lot to write the book? Thank you very much uh, for, for having read the book and for your remarks. Um, yeah, it's, it's very much a book on translation, which is a specific form of, of transformation. It's translating from 19th century to nowadays, translating from one language to another, translating what you think into what you do. It's like the conflicts of, of uh, translating everything. Did I travel a lot? Not while I was uh, writing book, but before I, I, I traveled a lot. But above all, I read a lot and I, I saw many films on you know 19th, German 19th century, on you know uh, habits that I didn't know on this period. Um, I think that you can perfectly write uh, a travel novel without moving from your own house, as long as your mind is always traveling. So I would say that although I travel a lot for that book, uh, particularly I, I did read a lot before. Um, you know because. Uh, I think that sometimes we uh, research, we do our research just to feel uh, the right to invent things. Once you have done your research, then you can invent without feeling an, uh, a betrayer. And that's why I spent like two years before starting writing that novel. Thank you. Thank you very much. Last one. Last question okay. of your life. Yes. Um, so my question is really quick. And I just want to know that you are from Argentina, right? And you were schooling in Spain. Um, how hard for you is to write in other language or in English being raised in a Hispanic context? Yeah, well, that's a very good question and has much to do with the, the, the present question because Travel of the Century is a novel focused on translation. Um, well, I, I'm very fascinated by the translation process. To me, a foreign language is a potential uh, translating conflict. Uh, so I see it always uh, as, uh, as a writer. I am a translator too. I translate poetry from, from English and French mainly. And, uh, and I like to translate poetry specifically but because there the form is more a problem. So I, I really uh, enjoy the, the former problems of translating something. And you know, I love so much translation that I not only do take part of the translation process of my books, when my translators allow me to do so, when they finish the draft, they share it with me, we exchange like hundreds, if not thousands of comments. And this process is like a couple of months before the draft is sent to the publishers. Not only that, but when I do like better some solution, say, in English, I go back to the original and I retranslate it from English into Spanish. So I become the translator of my translators. <laughs> and, and this is how this is an unending story, but not an unending event, so thanks so much. <laughs> this has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.